my mouth that the meditations of my heart be acceptable to the Oval Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In this current time when being a Christian is associated with everything from removing children from their parents to the burning cross of white hooded supremacy in khakis. It's hard to determine what it means to be, what it means to live one's life as a Christian. Is this Christian enterprise one of individual salvation and piety? Or is this Christian enterprise a theological underpinning for capitalism and advancing of the empire where the more wealth and the more status you have is an indication of God's blessing? Or is this Christian stuff a simplistic, naive worldview incompatible with this contemporary post-digital age? Church is the place where many different people who are following the way of Christ are supposed to come together we're supposed to come and understand what being Christian means. We know we're supposed to value differences and promote each person's worth. Yeah, but it's easier said than done. In today's verses, we read the word, words that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. These words ring true for us today, just like the church at Ephesus. We are learning to live in community while embracing differences, differences in worship styles, differences in cultures, differences in faith backgrounds and traditions, differences in our expectations, differences in how we communicate with each other, and exploring the emotions and frustrations created by the messiness that comes with trying to be in community. This week in a News and Views blog this week by their Vice President Michael G. Malden, he writes about one of my favorite theologians, C.S. Lewis' interpretation of what does it mean to be a Christian in today's world. He writes, in our era, era of social media, power politics, and a web of issues that keep us anxious and fearful, keeping the focus on what is distinctively Christian has become something of a lost art. Given the amount of energy spent by Christians articulating their positions and beliefs, one might get the impression that faith is only a set of ideas. But that's not the case. The real substance of faith dwells in the world of action. Yes, doctrines are important, but we grapple with beliefs in order to understand that we are empowered by Jesus to live in a new way. Christian faith becomes real when it's lived out. End quote. So when we look more more closely at Ephesians, if actually addressed to the church of that city, then this speaks to a very cosmopolitan audience, a place where the Orient and the West met culturally and relig religiously. No racially or economic diverse modern congregation has anything on the church at Ephesus. And its diversity was apparently not just a cause for celebration. It was also an occasion for division and conflict. And as the book of Acts shows us, this often led to conflict and to even people being expelled from the synagogue, or even to violence and imprisonment for the evangelist himself. Ephesus was complex. And part of the complexity, it appears to have had quite a number of people who were new to this Christian 
idea, this body of Christ idea. Earlier in uh, Ephesus, in the second chapter, verses 1 through 6, reading from the message translation, it says, It wasn't so long ago that you were mirrored in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing. And when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Which brings us to our scripture this morning, which provides some hard and clear rules for living out this thing called the Christian faith. The message translation reads, what this adds up to then is this. No more lies. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other. After all, when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. So from this perspective, speaking truth is a way of fulfilling our commitment to relate to one another in ways that promote peace and justice. This speaking truth thing struck me hard in a time in our culture where we dare not even to call a lie a lie. It's misinformation. It's spin. It's faulty intelligence. It's fake. In so much of popular culture, we are moved away from truth telling. And then there's no real truth. It's all perception without a moral compass. And when I talk about truth-telling, I'm not talking about the anger and bitterness when we say what's really on our minds when we're angry and say, hey, you can't handle the truth. That's not the truth I'm talking about. It doesn't mean we're speaking truth when, we're, when our words are motivated by anger. But this points us to honest dialogue. But we have to name the thing in order to address it and deal with it. No more lies, no more pretense. Now I like what comes next because if you tell the truth, if you try to uncover the truth, once you see the truth, it can be infuriating. But here scripture informs us to face that emotion. This passage does not forbid anger. It says, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Okay, can I tell you something? I so hate those buttons. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Oh, <laughs> As if there is some sanctification in not feeling the burn of wrongdoing. Now don't get me wrong, there's anger and then there is anger. There is the kind of anger that feels deeply when it comes to injustice and oppression. It's an anger that motivates us to do something that will relieve the suffering and the inequality of the world. But then there's that other kind of anger that we're very common to experience. It's the kind of anger that if we had a special weapon that could vaporize someone on the expressway <laughs> and we could get away with it, we might just do it. No, we would do it. We would definitely do it. That kind of anger that refuses to see the humanity of the person we're angry, angry with. That's a poisonous kind of anger. It's the kind of anger that makes us think we have every right to sit in judgment and pronounce final sentence on another human being, 
off with their heads. It's the kind of anger that always constitutes a dangerous sin because it always destroys relationships. And when relationships are destroyed, Paul calls it grieving the Holy Spirit. Going back to our text, go ahead and, and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. And here, in our rules for living, our new rules for living, for people who feel the world is so corrupt, the world is a doggy, doggy world, and that there are only two kinds of people, the givers and the takers, predators and their prey. That to make it, you gotta do all you can, to get all you can, and if it means stealing land, if it means stealing pension funds, if it means stealing opportunities, even stealing lives for profit. Scripture says, did you used to make ends meet by stealing? Well, no more. Get an honest job so that you can help others who can't work. What? That's quite a revolutionary idea. That your provision is linked to providing for those who can't provide for themselves. Just let that sink in for a moment. Your provision is linked to providing for those who can't provide for themselves. Okay, so the next part of this passage is my personal challenge. So I remember when I started seminary, I was determined to clean up my language. So I marched into work with a coffee can with the slit in top, on top of the little plastic top that I had labeled curse drop. 25 cents a curse word. I announced that I was inviting everyone in the office with me to journey with me adhering to this particular passage. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word against it. Okay, so I'm sad to inform you my individual donations always were in excess of five dollars a week. <laughs> I share that intimacy with you because living as a Christian is not about perfection but about knowing there's a better way to be and do and reaching for it. It's realizing that how you express yourself does matter. It's about recognizing both the healing power of words and the destructive power of words. That childhood rhyme we used to say was all wrong. Sticks and stones do break your bones and words do because words break your spirit, because words break your heart. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word again. Because we have an obligation to one another, for this Christian thing isn't an individual approach to life, but a communal one. It is not what Kant said, I think, therefore, I am. It's African Ubuntu, I am because we are. And the letter to the Ephesians takes on that philosophy. It insists that we are members of the same body and therefore we have a responsibility toward one another. Well, this may all seem very obvious to you. I mean, why would they put this in scripture as a part of our holy text? Well, part of the reason was in the first century to be condemned to ignorance was a terrible fate. 
And so any person that was interested in a virtuous life, following any philosopher of the time, would look to the teachings of that person and expecting that with their new knowledge, they would also modify their lifestyle to line up with that philosophy. And likewise for us who profess to be Christian, here the scripture is telling us what is expected of us. How to live in right relationship, how to disagree without being disagreeable, how to handle our disappointments, how to hear each other's thoughts and longings, and how to be of service. Make no mistake, scripture tells us, it grieves our loving creator when we fail to do that. It grieves our creator when we act in ways that destroy the fabric of humanity. That's why the last part of scripture says, don't grieve God. Don't break God's heart. The Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for God. Don't take that gift for granted. What Paul said to the Ephesian church was all its diversity should provide a theological foundation for how we participate in the life of the church today. Would this indeed make the church great again? <laughs> when I was reading this text, it brought to mind a story that um, Dwayne Dyer tells about Mother Teresa. On a visit to the United States, she was booked on a major nationally syndicated radio show to talk about her work in India. Well, this young interviewer who couldn't wait to be in the presence of this spiritual giant was struck by how small and ordinary she was. But then when she entered the room, he was at the same time struck by her spiritual energy. Mother Teresa, he asked, I'm going to go on the air and ask all my listeners to send money for your work. And she refused and said, I don't want your money. After a few minutes, he said, Mother Teresa, I can contact all the people I know in the entertainment industry, and we're going to put on this huge benefit for you, and you're going to go back to India with millions of dollars. And she refused. She said, I don't need or want your publicity. So frustrated by her refusals, he asked, Mother Teresa, isn't there anything I can do for you? And her response is, you want to do something? You want to help? Go outside and find a person with nothing living on the street and convince them that they are not convince them that God loves them. What a radical response. What a radical approach to creating Christian community. So people of God, let us go forward this week being reminded that our faith sets a different standard and the bar is very high. For we are called to be in the world, but not of it. Know by your actions that you can be among the great ones, ushering in the kingdom of God. And if you're here without a church home, we welcome you to join this faith community. Now, we're still a work in progress. And we're not perfect, but we are willing to keep striving for the goal set before us. So if you want to learn more about us, join myself and one of our deacons at our welcome table in the parlor during coffee hour directly following this service. Amen. Amen.